not live yet. Hold on. All right, everyone. Uh, if you're seeing this, then you are in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Welcome to Association Chat. And let me give you just a second while uh, you get yourself situated. This week, we're going to have an excellent, excellent show. Um, Jeff DeCanya, a good friend of mine, uh, is here to talk with us. He's just come back from GSAE. And so we're going to get started in just a second. So if you are on live then uh, or watching through Facebook, go ahead and give me a comment or give me a signal. And that would be great. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, so here we are, and I am so thrilled to be here. So welcome to this week's association chat. This is your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. For this week's chat, I am talking with Jeff DeCanya. He is a chief strategist and founder of Foresight First. He is known as the association contrarian. He is also, you can blame him for the rather randy hashtag ass and chat. Uh, and so he is here to talk with us about the future of learning and work. And like I said, just came back from GSAE's uh, annual conference talking about something very similar. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kiki. It's great to be back with you on Association Chat. It's been a few months. I know. It's been a little bit. We need to like, I don't know <laughs> what we need to do. We need to make this happen more frequently or something, I guess. Um, so you're here. You just recently have talked about uh, this subject to GSAE, but I want you to talk to me and I want you to talk to this community about this whole subject of the future of learning and work um, mm -hmm. how the two are, are interconnected and what we need to know moving into the future. So I guess my first, my first big question for you is, uh, why this topic, Jeff, what's, what's the big deal? What's the, what's the big deal about the future of learning and work? Well, I mean, for, for me personally, the, uh, the issue is I have a, a briefing coming up at the end of month, end of June on, on the future, uh, on the future of learning and work for association decision makers. That's on June 28th at two o'clock and and uh, it's an issue of great importance uh, to me for that reason, but also I think it's a great, an issue of great importance for uh, associations because uh, on the one hand, this is an area where associations really should um, be well positioned to be influential, right? To play, be right. playing a role in, um, in how the future of learning work is shaped. And yet at the same time, I feel like associations, many of them, maybe most of them aren't quite there yet mm -hmm. um, and and need to be thinking about um, how learning and work are going to shift over the course of say the next 10 to 12 years say between now and 2030 um, and what they're going to need to do to prepare their stakeholders for that so uh, what I spoke at uh, about at GSAE last week was not this topic per se but actually about the topic of uh, developing a foresightly perspective, which ah, is yes. so important for um, for our stakeholders. So what I thought we would do today is go through this topic using the framework, the six attributes, if you will, of developing a foresightly perspective to frame this up a little bit and help the um, people who are watching now, people who are going to watch the recording, um, think about this in a way that really does two things. One gives them some insight into issues related to the future of learning and work, but also helps them see how they can apply um, the thinking around developing a foresightly perspective to any issue, really, yeah. um, and use that for their, for their benefit. Now, I want to uh, alert people who are watching this uh, or listening to this episode, if you're listening to it later, um, that there are previous episodes where Jeff is on here and he he's talked about um, some other aspects of of 
having a foresightly perspective. And so I would encourage you uh, when I go back in the show notes, I will link to those different episodes so that you're able to go back and check out some of those previous episodes. They're really, really good. Uh, but Jeff, okay, so let's, let's jump into this. Um, what's the best way to attack it? Like, should we go with the, the yeah. first, the first of the six or what do you think? Yeah, so we'll just go through them. I'll, I'll, I'll do one at a time. We can stop and talk about it. So, um, the other thing I'll just mention too, is I'll make sure, uh, for show notes, um, Kiki, that you have, I wrote an article actually for GSA for their magazine on this topic. Okay. And, um, I can send you that article and you can provide that to people as a resource as well. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm going to try to talk a little bit louder here. It looks like my uh, my mic might not be picking me up very well. Okay. So I'll work on that. So, uh, so the first attribute of a foresightly perspective is discard orthodoxy, right? And that's really all about looking at the deep seated assumptions that we've been making, um, the deep seated assumptions about how the world works, um, and then questioning them, challenging them. Um, getting beyond those those orthodox beliefs to recognize what's happening all around us and establish a new belief system that prepares us for the future. And I think that there are, when it comes to the issue of learning and work, I think there are a number of um, orthodoxies that we have to look at. Um, I think the first one is one that is not unfamiliar uh, for people who've heard me over the years uh, talk about this. And I don't want to sound like a broken record. Um, but I think it's really important for us to uh, think past the orthodoxy of membership um, because the issues around learning and work when it comes to the impact of automation, the impact of artificial intelligence, the need for us to be working better with machines um, and all the disruption that is likely to occur. And some, some measure of disruption will occur, whether it'll be a dystopian disruption or whether it'll be something less than that. Um, it remains to be seen, but there's no question we're all going to have to be better at working with machines. Right. So, so really the assumption we have to stop making is that this is a membership issue. It's a stakeholder issue, right? We have stakeholders who are going to be affected by this. Some of them are first degree stake, uh, stakeholders, their members. Some of them are not that they are second or third degree stakeholders, but nothing changes, right? We, mm -hmm. the, Automation is not going to respect the boundaries that we create around membership. So we have to help all of our stakeholders prepare, regardless of whether they happen to be members of the association um, at any given moment in time. Hmm. So that's, I think that's one thing, is that the orthodox beliefs we hold around membership um, will actually make it harder for us to support our stakeholders' learning and prepare them for a different future of work. Um, huh. So I think, that's, can, yeah, I, can I dig yeah, into that yeah, a little bit course, more? Yeah, okay, yeah. so when you're saying we're thinking past the orthodoxy of membership, that's like a traditional type of membership and maybe thinking about the people that are, that would be, you'd be serving in like the industry and in like the community. Um, I mean, help me, help me. Is that what you're talking about here? Yeah. Well, I mean, let's, let's take, for example, you know, what's going on in the legal profession right now, right? <clears throat> the legal profession is um, looking very seriously at how technology is going to replace some of the work that is currently done by um, paralegals, by, you know, junior attorneys. And, this is not this this can't be seen as an issue of who's a member of the bar association, you know, or who's a member of this legal specialty group. It has to be looked upon. This is happening to the entire profession. Industry, right? yeah. Yeah. The same thing is happening in accounting, right? Right. Accounting is recognizing that many of the activities of accountants, right? Uh, of auditors uh, as well. Many of the financial, the core financial um, work that they've done historically is going to be automated, right? Mm -hmm. It's already being automated. And so they have to prepare people who work in that field to be able to adapt, to contribute in different ways, um, and to learn what is required to be successful in that environment. That is not a membership issue, right? Right. It's everybody who is a certified public accountant. It's everybody who's an auditing professional. Um, and so we can, 
you know, it doesn't mean we don't, again, I always want to remind people, it's not to say we don't have members. Right. It's to say that the future of learning and work will not be defined along the boundaries that we have set up for ourselves. Right. right? And we have to respect the fact that these forces are stronger than any of the boundaries that we've created. That's, you know, I think that that right there is worth thinking about a little bit because um, I can imagine being an executive director, sitting back, listening to them, this membership director uh, and thinking, okay, I already have, you know, I'm taxed with, with trying to do so much. I wonder if my board is going to appreciate me coming to them and saying that I need to focus on, uh, you know, serving this entire industry, I've got so much on my plate. And I know that there are a lot of people who they're worried about, they might think this is great, but they may, they may feel like this is beyond the scope of what they're prepared to be able to do. So for that pushback, what do you have to say? Well, and I think actually it's an interesting point because it actually relates to another orthodoxy mm -hmm. um, that I think we have to uh, address, right? which is the orthodoxy of time versus attention. Because mm. um, I think often the argument that you're proposing um, mm. is one that is based in part on time. It's also based in part on resources. Um, but we tend to focus a lot on do we have the time to um, do these things that are necessary. And I think we have to start, it doesn't mean we don't look at the time, right? It's not an mm -hmm. either or choice. It's a how do we place the emphasis choice. And increasingly, the emphasis has to be placed on the attention issue. How are we allocating our attention? And are we allocating our attention to activities that will prepare us for the future? Or are we allocating our attention to activities that are really about sustaining what we already have in place, optimizing the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. And what that becomes is uh, that's a that's a more pragmatic way of expressing the deeper concern, which is are we doing things that enable us to cope with what's going on? Or are we doing things organizationally and individually that allow us to adapt to what is happening? And I think we need more focus on shifting our attention toward adaptation rather than trying to manage our time and simply figuring out ways to cope with, what, with what's happening. Because the issue that I think yeah. a lot of, um, I think the issue that I think a lot of executive directors will face is that are they going to be the ones to shift the organization toward the future? Or are they going to um, hand it off to their successor? Right. Or, or will they hand it off to someone else who will then in turn hand it off to someone else? How much longer will we wait until we start adapting toward the future? And on this issue in particular, on the issues of the future of learning and work, there's no time to be um, waiting any longer to be handing it off to someone else another three or five years from now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I love that point too, because um, I, I think that so many of us are in that, it, it, we think about time versus attention, and we think that it has to be a certain way, but there are other, there are other ways to address the issue of those things that we need to pay attention to. And sometimes, you know, I think that, um, we default into thinking that it's a time question when yeah. maybe it's not. So, yeah. All right. and, and it's, it's easy to, it's understandable why we do that, right? Yeah. Because what we're used to doing, right. Yeah. We're acclimated to handling it that way. Everything we run our lives based on time, right? Based on watches and calendars and our phones and everything. And what we, and unfortunately what that has actually done in the digital era, it has fragmented our attention so greatly that we still think about it in terms of time rather than the allocation of attention resources. And so we actually, from a learning perspective, we are actually exacerbating this problem by you know more and more events learning events are offering you know five minute sessions 15 minute sessions right. 30 minute sessions because they are actually saying well people's attention is so fragmented so let's play into that right 
And again, I don't want to suggest that it's a terrible thing to do that. What I'm saying is that we need to have more balance and right. say, you know what, five and 15 and 30 minute sessions don't necessarily offer the learning that we need. We need to find other ways to give people the deeper learning that's required for them to be able to adapt for the future. You know, that's so interesting that you bring that up because I actually, I've had this on my mind a little bit um, since the, uh, I was listening to the Apple keynote yesterday and, you know, the stuff that came out where uh, both Apple and Google talked about the ways that they are building into uh, new operating systems and stuff, how to, um, how to rein in and, and sort of control the time that we spend mm -hmm. on our devices. Yep. And I think it's interesting that even, you know, even the purveyors of, of these devices that, that the ideas that we get hooked, that we get drawn in, that we use them all the time, even they're saying, yeah, so at this healthy, at this unhealthy extent, right. It actually is counterproductive for us. We need to like, you know, I actually think that's that's a brilliant uh, idea that they're recognizing that um, by instead pulling people back from that so much and refocusing on ways that they can become embedded health wise so that people can't afford to be a, away from it. Um, well, the, re devices. the re the research is very strong on this because we know the addictive properties of phones are built to be addictive. Yeah. Um, the research is very strong. There's, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. Um, the, the research shows, they did a research study with some students, mm -hmm. university students, and there were three different things that they, they had one group of students who were in a room where their phones were in front of them. Mm -hmm. and then they were asked to be doing a task. They could see their phones. And there was another group where the phones were in the room, but not near them, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was a third group where the phones were in a completely different room, right? Wow. And the performance of that last group was dramatically higher than the first group. Yeah. Right? So e if your phone is with you, even if it's turned over, yeah. right, and you're not looking at the screen, the very presence of the phone has a dramatically negative effect on your ability to concentrate and focus on completing tasks. Whereas when your phone is totally somewhere else, right, totally in another space, not anywhere near you, your ability to concentrate is dramatically increased. I totally believe that. I totally believe it. And people didn't believe it, um, you know, when you and I both work for ourselves, you know, and so uh, people couldn't believe it when I said that there are days when I take my cell phone and I put it in a totally different room mm -hmm. when I have to get something done because it shouldn't be that I get like I know that. Yeah. You know, my daughter, she's in grade school. Yes, the school could call. I understand. But I also have a husband who could take that call. And also, once upon a time, we didn't have cell phones. My mom was a school teacher. Nobody could come pick me up. And you know what? I survived. So it'd be right. okay. <laughs> it'd be and, and just and just to just to give you a sense of how prevalent this is, since you and I have been having this conversation, my phone has rung three times. Gosh. Yeah. Right? And, and, and I've had to, you know, hit decline each time while we're having our, our conversation. So there's one other orthodoxy that I just want to um, quickly talk about before we move on, mm -hmm. which is, um, and it's a longstanding orthodoxy that is outside of associations, but it's an important one. This idea of hard versus soft skills is totally unhelpful, right? It's totally unhelpful. Why? Because... Why? They're, the things that are most important in a world in which people are going to have to work better with machines are not, they are not soft, right? Right. This, this is not semantics. This is actually drawing an important distinction among the skills that people need to develop, right? There are technical skills, which are, what are the, I don't mean that in a, in a technology sense. I mean that what are the technical skills of being a lawyer yeah. or the technical skills of being in manufacturing or being in healthcare, right? What are the things you need to know to be able to function in a specific industry or profession? Then there's the digital skills, right, which we all have to develop. How do we get better at using technology? What technologies apply specifically to our fields um, or just generally? How do we use technology better? Um, and for in some cases, for example, in some fields, maybe now that's coding, right? Do we have to be 
better at coding. Right. And then and then there's the human skills. And those human skills like creativity and empathy and uh, imagination and innovation and communications. Um, <clears throat> these are not soft, mm -hmm. right? These are the skills that will distinguish us from artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, deep learning applications. These are the things that robots and AI will not be able to do for the foreseeable future in the way that human beings do them. And so this idea that these are soft skills is a huge misnomer. So we have to drop this orthodoxy of it's hard versus soft. It's not. It's technical and digital and human, some combination. And that combination will change over time, right? It'll become more important for us to have um, those uh, human skills because even, even sometimes more so in digital skills because technology over time, AI, will become better, for example, at, at coding and programming um, than any human being could be. So what will really make the difference for us is how effective are we at using our human capabilities, uniquely wow. human capabilities. Wow, okay, so I love hearing that because that is kind of something that is, I mean, historically, that was that was where the humans were able to really rise it, through our artistic pursuits through you know you think of people like michelangelo you think about um da vinci you think about people who they did more than they were more than just an artist right they were inventors and they studied all kinds of different things and through the industrialization, um, through through this idea of uh, building a factory worker mindsets, a lot of the creativity, the curiosity, and those things that are really, I, th I think like the tool sets of what makes us stand out with our imaginations, our ability to, to think beyond and to envision new possibilities, that's going to be something that we really need to invest in because, and now, like right now, because um, having that, you know, sort of factory worker mentality, it, it's not, we can't afford to just do that now. Now we need to think in more creative ways. That's right. And, and, and the issue that, you know, I think really comes up, and there's a great new book out called Prediction Machines by three professors at the University of Toronto, and they're applying an economic framework to artificial intelligence and their basic premise is that you know what ai what M machine learning deep learning um makes cheaper is prediction right and what prediction is 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 finding information that is missing from the information that you have right, right. and so you make predictions right it's what ai does very well right ai looks at information and makes predictions about what it means based on having been trained by um other data sets and what that makes more important when you, when you reduce the cost of prediction, right, and your dog agrees, um, is it, it makes judgment so much more valuable, right? And that's a human capability, right? That's a fundamental human capability. So we have to improve our judgment. We have to improve our creativity, our imagination, all the things that we are better than machines at right now and we'll be at least for a while right there may come a point in time when artificial intelligence break breakthroughs really do make machines better at that or at least as good as we are but i don't foresee that happening for a while and no one really does so as part of the, the future of learning and work we have to help instead of trying to prepare our stakeholders for just the narrowly technical capabilities that they need. We need to help them develop these human capabilities because as time moves on, that is what will make them future ready um, for whatever happens as technology unfolds. I'm not hearing you, Kiki. You put yourself on mute. 
I think I got myself off mute now. <laughs> my dog, my dog is like really. I think she's like dreaming or something, and I I don't know how to reach her. Uh, but anyway, yeah, no, it's it's. So if your board member comes to you and says something like, "I I want to move into the future, but should I focus on?" I, I should probably focus on coding, right? Or do I need to work on building my uh, imagination and creativity? I mean, is it all of the above? Is it is it focus more on on how you can apply your creativity and I would say and curiosity to areas where you have strength already? Hmm. Or, I mean, yeah, <clears throat> I don't think your board member needs to learn how to code. <laughs> I hope not. I really hope not. I mean, only because they're probably not going to need that. I mean, they, it's not, no. not, nothing is going to be bad about them understanding yeah. technology. I mean, certainly we all have to understand technology, but I don't think we need to turn our board members into coders. No. Um, and even for our kids, um, you know, coding might be fun for them. It'll help them develop a familiarity with technology. But as I said earlier, eventually, and it's already happening, AI, yeah will be far better coders. Oh, I'm waiting for it. I, I really am desperate for that to take place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're already having um, applications that are being written by AI. So yeah. um, familiarity with technology in every aspect is beneficial because it helps shape your mindset. But it's not really about trying to tr create, um, in my view, um, a, a huge generation of coders um, because within the next decade, you know, within that 10 to 12 year time frame, we're going to be seeing a lot more um, technology developed directly um, using AI as the as the basis for that. So, how does this impact you know our associations today and and some of the people who are listening right now um, who, when it comes to this particular orthodoxy of hard versus soft skills? Um, how do, would they take what you're saying right now and apply it? Uh, in their minds of their their association's relation to work and learning? So I think uh, it goes back to something I, I said a minute ago, and I'll make it more specific, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if you've got an industry certification, right, or a certificate, right, or some kind of credential that you're offering to your stakeholders, you know, you want to take a hard look at how much of what you are training them on mm -hmm. is actually a target for automation. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, so if you look at it at the level of activities and tasks, right, what are the things that they are asked to do in order to earn that credential, that certification? Right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> how much of that could eventually be automated? Right. And should we be training them on something that within five or 10 years yeah. will actually set them up to be removed? From the system, from the process, because technology uh, will take over, and instead, design those credentials yeah. to balance the technical aspects with the human aspect. You know, I just had a really interesting discussion about uh, something related to this the other day with Amy Dufresne from HRCI. She's the executive director of of the HR Certification Institute. And um, and she's been really focusing on this question uh, because obviously, if you're you know a, you know executive director of uh, HRCI and it's all about certifications, she's very very uh, interested in in what what the results are because people all over this industry are saying, okay, well, okay, what if you know this skill is then automated? This credential is worth what? at this point like you need to if you really care about the people who are going through and getting this you do want to to make sure that they're prepared so that's absolutely i i know people are are focused on that well and and, and you know I, just to sure shift gears a little bit to to the second attribute of the four slightly perspective which is clarify orientation i think you know what we want to do in terms of clarifying our orientation is make sure we're adopting a holistic perspective on how all this is going to unfold, right? Because it's not just about the technology, right? It's mm -hmm. also the, the future of learning and work is not just will not just be shaped by tech, although tech will be, I think, the most significant influencer, the most significant force. It will also be shaped 
by you know an aging workforce mm -hmm. and economic inequality and um, you know just the whole demographic shift of our society um, you know all these forces are going to inf influence who it is we're obviously who we're talking about in terms of learners yeah. um, what it is they're going to want and need to learn how they will choose to learn but I think the main thing we want to look at in associations is how can we shift the focus of learning away from incidental learning to intentional learning? How do we make learning an intentional activity for the stakeholders that we're trying to serve Ooh. today and going forward, rather than something that is incidental that comes up when they get a brochure in the mail, hey, you know, or, or when they get a, an email, right? Whatever, whatever method of communication, you know, and they show up at an event, how do we how do we challenge them and encourage them to focus their attention on learning as an intentional activity every day that helps them prepare themselves to adapt to the realities of this uh, shifting marketplace? Oh, you know who I think? I wonder if she's still watching right now. You know who that makes me think of? Uh, and I actually I don't know if it's Heather, if it's you or if it's Nick who's on from Q Career, but um, so uh, you've talked, have you talked with Heather from Q Career? No. Heather w Wetzler, Winsler, um, uh, brilliant. Okay, so Q Career exists to bring the um, education of different associations to fill the skills gap that exists uh, for people in different industries and connect connect associations with the people who are searching, they're starting with like students entering the workforce, but they're also looking at people who need to quickly learn new skills to move from one career to another. So looking at people in career transition, but um, which is really kind of an interesting concept. You guys should probably get together, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Nick. Yeah, I was gonna say, I bet you have some interesting things to say about this, some interesting uh, insights about how people could move from incidental to intentional learning, because that's definitely something that um, that I know that is something that they look <laughs> at pretty regularly. <laughs> <laughs> I think Gucci just had Gucci, my poodle. I think she just had a nightmare. I don't know, <laughs> but she's awake now, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, it's really it, it's you know, developing an orientation that is uh, a future orientation rather than, as I said earlier, you know, yeah. how do we optimize the status quo? How do we optimize what we already have? And again, that's, that's tempting. Tempting to say, okay, we've got something that is working pretty well, if not excellently, so let's just keep doing that instead of you know, what we really need to do, which is how do we continuously disrupt what we already have and continue to adapt um, toward a future state that is always shifting. We all have to work together right. to offer this, right? And, um, and unfortunately, that is not something that is always the top priority uh, for many associations. Not all. Some are there. Some are doing it, right? Um, but it is not a. It is not yet a widespread effort. I think to really rethink this. Mm -hmm. um, in a way where we make that we make that shift um, every day, not just not just you know um, getting ready for another two or three years from now, but starting right now to make it start making it happen. Do you have Do you have any examples offhand of associations who are who seem to be doing that right, or is that something that you might be able to share with me offline? Because I'd be curious to know kind of, you know, some good examples to look at of people who, organizations who are um, choosing to focus in that direction. Well, I, I think the accounting profession is doing a pretty good job of this. I mean, certainly the yeah. stuff, stuff that I see coming out of Maryland Association, CPAs, um, even AICPA, um, I think they're doing a good job of maybe not, maybe not the entirety of the accounting profession, um, but certainly within the accounting profession, MACPA mm -hmm. is, a, is a good example of, of this. They are making a big effort to help their help accountants become future ready. 
That's smart. Uh, That's so smart for them to do that. Yeah, I, and it's it's essential because, yeah. as I said earlier, it's all the the automation in accounting is already happening. Right. Right. So, okay, so we've talked about the thinking past the orthodoxy of membership. We've talked about the orthodoxy of time versus attention. We've talked about hard versus soft skills, uh, which are more than just semantics. So um, what are some of the other things that we need to be looking at? So we've talked about the scoring, just go back to the attributes of a foresightly perspective. We've talked about the scoring orthodoxy. We talked a little bit about clarifying orientation. The third attribute is uh. displaying humility. Right. Okay. okay. And, and I think this is important on two levels. Um, one, and, and really it's the same idea, but, but expressed in a slightly different fashion. So um, for, for learners, right, which is all of us, um, you know, the, the phrase, I don't know, um, has felt like something you never say. Um, because you don't want to be seen as ignorant, right? You don't want to mm -hmm. be seen as, well, how can you say you don't know, right? That's not, that's, you're, you're being paid here, right, to, yeah. to know, right? Um, and yet, <clears throat> instead of looking at, I don't know, as an admission of failure, I think we have to start seeing it as an edge for preparing for the future. And so um, having the humility to say, look, I don't know what the right answer is here, but I'm going to, or and might be better, and I'm going to find out what it is. Yeah. And investing yourself in doing that. For the person who is organizing learning activities, um, you know, the, the learning person in the association, the question you want to be asking yourself is, how can we find ways to put our learners in more situations where they have to display humility, right? Mm. Because by displaying humility, being, being comfortable with that, they will build their capacity to do that all the time, right? That's making the shift from instant learning to intentional learning. Mm -hmm. And so helping them into situations where they have to say, look, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to use my network. I'm going to pursue my learning to Ugh. figure out what the answer is. Um, that makes people more comfortable with being able to do that day in and day out, which is what we need them to do. So I have to wonder, what are some of the ways that people can encourage others to do that? Like, what are some of the exercises or practices or, I mean, and, and how, I don't know. How do you know how much? How much of that humility, Jeff? Do we really need? <laughs> I feel like I don't know a lot. So, like, I'm always. I feel like I'm forever saying I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, to say I don't know, and I think even even a step further, in in that finding out, I don't know, and I'm going to find out, is acknowledging. Uh, that you need the help of others, maybe that Absolutely. collaboration piece, you know, that's the part I, I think I'm, I can get pretty comfortable with. I don't know. I think it's that next piece where it's, if I have to move beyond Google and books and stuff like that, where I have to actually ask other human beings for help, where sometimes I, I uh, struggle, I'm getting better at it, but I still, well, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard for all of us. You know, yeah. no one, no one really wants to ask for help. Right. I mean, and, and there's there's actually, you know, been some research. I saw an article recently that that talked about that. Right. Where it's hard for us to um, to ask other people, ask our co-workers or, or friends for help. Um, and um, and yet it's exactly the thing we need to start figuring out how to do more often. Yeah. Um, because we we, you know, no one of us is as smart as all of us. Right. And that's something we've been saying. For a long time and yet we've now finally reached the point where i think we're starting to realize that in a world in which automation um and artificial intelligence is increasingly present our one of our best ways of being able to stay um involved in the process over the long term is our ability to um say you know what ai knows a lot about this or that, or it can do this or that better than I can. But what I can do is I can admit the fact that I don't know something and then talk to 
a lot of other people and use information that I get from them as well as other sources to develop an answer to something that takes into consideration more than what AI can do. What? So it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a big shift, but it's a necessary one. And, and one we have to practice, right? That's the reason why I'm saying that if we can create situations where our uh, learners are given the chance to practice this, it'll be easier for them to do that when they're actually at work on a day in day basis. So here's, so here's a good question from Michael. He says, what do you see as the role responsibility lines of CEOs and board chairs moving forward in this process? Uh, <laughs> honestly, I don't know. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that to illustrate the point. I'm saying that with all candor. Um, I don't know because um, I think that, you know, here what I'm talking about is, is less about what goes on at the board level, although mm -hmm. I think that's certainly important for that, um, and more about how we think about this as an organizational activity, right? How do we support learning with the stakeholders mm -hmm. we're trying to serve? Certainly, I think there's, um, it's necessary for um, CEOs and boards and board chairs to be able to say, you know what, we don't know the answer to these questions, right? These are, these are complicated, complex questions. Mm -hmm. How do we, um, how do we prepare ourselves to be better at addressing them, right? If we're, if we're, if what we are being asked to bring to the table is our judgment, then we have to uh, prepare ourselves to be able to exercise that judgment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know that I have it fully thought through. Hmm. Okay, so where are we headed next, Jeff? We talked about this perfect, this uh, displaying humility and being able to say, I don't know, and I'm going to find out. Maybe looking at ways to build humility so that people can can move from the incidental to intentional learning yeah and so i think that um you know the next attribute is nurturing curiosity right nurture curiosity yay my favorite topic yeah. ever i love that yes and and you know i mean so much of the learning we're going to have to do um going forward is going to be into things that maybe we don't have a special interest in, right? Um, but we are all curious. We just have to reconnect with that curiosity, right? So we have to look upon curiosity as the energy source for our motivation to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And um, part of curiosity, by the way, is, is empathy, right? Empathy and curiosity are related. Um, curiosity in the broadest sense is about the entire world. Empathy is about curiosity about people, right? Um, like a, a curiosity about what's happening with them and the ability to relate to that. Um, and so nurturing curiosity in our learners will um, help them do a better job of using their attention effectively, right? Um, so, you know, I'm really excited about artificial intelligence. I'm really excited about um, autonomous vehicles. Not mm -hmm. everyone is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, but nevertheless, people have to learn about things even if they're not excited about them, right? And so the more that we can um, help them develop that, that natural or reconnect with that natural curiosity, the better off they will be um, in this environment, um, bringing that curiosity to bear every day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You're preaching to the choir. I, I like, I, um, I think I've, I've shared before on here about my passion for learning and how I actually had to rebuild my curiosity purposefully because I was reading a book by, uh, Michael Gelb and it was about, um, well, I, there's a lot of books by him and you should check them out. But um, anyway, the very first 
attribute that you were supposed to explore so that you could think more like Leonardo da Vinci uh, was to this development of curiosity. And as I read through this very first chapter, I just, I, I recognized that I, just how little I asked uh, why and how and where, like I just didn't ask. And I, I depended so much on assumptions that mm -hmm. I, um, that it, it just, I, I lost that curiosity. And because of that, I had stopped learning in the way that I used to so that I wasn't able to bring any new fire to any of the work that I was doing. And once I started building slowly, like challenging myself to ask questions of everyone I, I met, whether I really wanted to or not, or whether I really thought I was interested or not, it's like it opened the entire world. And so I think that if anybody's out there and, lis and like listening to this and thinking, I'm, I'm curious enough, or I don't know how this applies, I can say for sure that um, once I started consciously working on that, that's when um, association chat got more interesting. That's when like, that's when so much had started taking off because I started learning again. Mm -hmm. And you get better, you get better at asking questions, you get better mm -hmm. at digging into it. And it, 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 it does, it fires up. I love how you put it. You said, uh, curiosity is the energy source for our motivation to learn. And I just, I think you're absolutely right, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the reason why it's fourth in my attributes is because I think before you get to that, right, you've got to, as you said, you've got to kind of clear out those assumptions, right? Yeah. And and then you guess, okay, now that I'm clear of my assumptions, how do I want to orient myself to this issue, right? What's my perspective on this? And how do I bring the humility to bear in being able to say, you know, look, I don't know everything there is to know or even anything that yeah. there is to know about this issue. And then once you've done those things, then you can really aim your curiosity, right? You can target your curiosity more effectively toward, okay, well, here's where I want to pursue learning in something that maybe I don't know anything about, and maybe I don't have a real burning interest in it, but I need to understand it, right? Because it's going to have an effect on me. And by tapping into that curiosity, it will sustain your motivation over time, and um, and and perhaps you will discover that you actually do have a, a real you know real passion for it, or maybe not. But it's okay, right? Yeah, it yeah. It doesn't necessarily matter that you have if you have a particular passion for a specific subject. The issue is, can you use that the, the real passion that we want to encourage in people in this changing world of work? is the passion for learning mm -hmm. and and the curiosity piece um will really help with that um if we can reconnect with it yeah you know i i, I think back to why our um society jumped forward you know at different points in history and i i I always go back to that, um, the same Stephen Johnson book where it's, it's talking about where innovation comes from. And, um, it was talking about like the coffee houses and how important they were because they brought people of all types of life, all walks of life, all different professions, all different, you know, um, uh, expertise and they brought them together in one place. And so when those people talked, when they had these conversations, they were able to apply all kinds of different knowledge from all different types of areas. And so now we have, um, we have the internet, we have the ability to jump in and explore in all kinds of different areas. But what we've lost between then and now is the curiosity to explore. And so for some of us, some of us, some people are just naturally good at that, but, mm. but for some of us, that was kind of, uh, as we get older, we just have naturally gotten less curious about it. And I think in some ways, um, the technology that we have available to us has made it both easier and harder because things are served to us yeah. so that we're only actually seeing more and more the things that we already have shown that we're interested in, whether it be perspectives, uh, philosophies, you know, 
um, or the types of things that we search for, um, what our search engines and everything have gotten really good at is serving us the information that they think, that it thinks, that these different uh, machines think that we're looking for what we've taught them that we're looking for. So we mm -hmm. have to purposefully, intentionally break beyond that and maybe search purposefully outside of that, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think, you know, I just, I just was going to the Google homepage. Well, there, but, you know, because the, the I'm feeling lucky button um, <laughs> on Google search, you yeah. know, is it actually, it applies to a couple of the attributes. You know, one of them is, is curiosity, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pursue this search in a way where I'm, you know, I'm going to see what happens. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, and I think that, you know, the reason why we lose our curiosity is because we are told, you know, often from a very early age, you know, curiosity killed the cat. Right? Yeah. And, um, you know, being curious is seen as weird. Being curious is seen as dangerous. Um, and so, therefore, yeah. a lot of people just lose sight of their curiosity. Um, they lose track of it. But I know, I know that all living beings, all living beings, are curious because at some point in time, everything is new, right? Right. And as I always like to say, if you, if you doubt that for one second, go on Facebook and look for puppy versus doorstop videos. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever looked for that. <laughs> you know, because every, every puppy um, that interacts with the doorstop doesn't know what they're looking at, um, doesn't have any idea what it will do to them, right, how it will snap back on them. And yet they do it anyway because it's new and they're curious about it, right? And um, and that you know, and, there, and that's to me, that's all the evidence I need to know that every living being, human or otherwise, um, is curious. Mm -hmm. And we need to nurture that curiosity in ourselves um, to use it right effectively for our benefit and also for the benefit of others. How do you nurture that in yourself? I mean, I'm turning this and I'm focusing it on you for a second, but like. Um, how do you apply this? Because I know that you take these things very seriously. Um, how are you applying the same thing to yourself? How do you try to develop your curiosity? Um, I, I try to, you know, um, I think one way that I, I try to do that is by having a lot of sources of information um, that I'm you know, looking at. So I'm still looking at my feeds on Feedly you know, every day and um, looking for things in those feeds that capture my attention um, that I might not otherwise, you know, see. So I've got a lot of stuff going there and I'm scanning it all the time regularly to, to try to find things um, that, you know, if I didn't track it in that way, mm -hmm. I might miss, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, and that's just, you know, that's just one thing that I do, I try to do every day to, um, to see what, you know, what's out there uh, that I should be looking at to try to better understand whatever, you know, whatever issues are important. So that's one thing that I regularly do. Wonderful. Well, um, as we're rounding out the hour, I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit, um, maybe one last piece that you want people to take with them. Um, before we let them go for the week and, uh, you know, a little bit more about the future of work and learning for associations. So there's, there's two, two final attributes that I'll just touch on briefly, which is pursue discovery and embrace serendipity. Ooh, right? those look good. And pursue discovery is about a deeper kind of learning um, than the traditional, you know, sort of incidental learning, right? It's more intentional. Um, which is about, it challenges us to reconsider our worldview. And discovery is a kind of learning in which we are um, making sense of things, making meaning around things, and making decisions around things on an ongoing basis. It's a cycle that we're going through over and over again. Um, serendipity is um, not so much about chance as it is about finding something you didn't expect, um, but you saw it because you were paying attention. Mm, and mm. Um, I think, you know, those, you know, when it comes to the future of learning and work, um, all of these attributes, and particularly these last three, 
are things that we want to nurture in ourselves as learners, and we also want to nurture them in the learners that we serve. Um, helping them be more curious, helping them pursue discovery, helping them embrace serendipity, that will prepare all of us um, to be better uh, equipped to operate effectively in a future of learning and work that is going to look very different than um, the world we find ourselves in. Wow. I don't know about all of you, um, but Jeff, you this has been an amazing discussion. And uh, it always is. But I mean, this one really, I, I think that I think that I wish I wish everybody would listen to this, actually. Um, I think it's so helpful for just the individual. But definitely, if you're in a position where um, you're supposed to be helping uh, professionals in any industry, in any profession to move forward or to do better or to lead uh, better lives in the future, lead the organization in a better way, you have to be teaching people more about how to embrace these different aspects, these six aspects. So where can people get more information, Jeff? So if people are interested in the um, June 28th um, briefing, um, they can um, shoot me an email, uh, and I'm happy to send them information, foresightfirst at gmail.com. And um, it's June 28th at 2 o'clock Eastern time okay. um, on the future of learning and work. And, um, yeah, if anyone's interested, just shoot me an email at foresightfirst at gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we leave, I want to give a shout out. I didn't do this at the very uh, front end, but I want to give a shout out to Fontiva, the AMS for Innovation, for their ongoing support of Association Chat and the Association community. And I want to thank all of you. I want to thank my wonderful guest, Jeff DeCanya, my dear friend, Jeff DeCanya, who I uh, hope you. we can find some time to catch up very soon. Uh, yeah. And without all of you watching or listening, <laughs> and uh, and then I want to also uh, say thanks to all of you for participating, for listening, to supporting, and in whatever channel you happen to partake of Association Chat, I truly hope you enjoyed the show. If you like the show, subscribe to the Association Chat Amazon Echo Flash briefing. That's pretty exciting. That's something that I'm trying to update several times a week, not quite daily but several times a week, and it has been a fascinating joy ride <laughs> for me to be finding a new channel to use. Um, and then also be sure to like, thank, subscribe, and do all the things to share the love. And until next time, everyone, keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. I hope you have a great week, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.